Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and I am here with Arlen Schumer, illustrator and comic book historian, comic book appreciatist. I don't care if that's a word or not, it is with you. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to Comic Book University, brother. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me on, Bill. Absolutely. Thanks for showing up. Uh, so, so showing up? Where am I going to go? <laughs> so... You, for crying out loud, you have got an impressive as hell history for anybody who's even seen a comic book on a spinner rack. Of course, it's been a long time since we've had spinner racks, but you get the gist. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Well, the first thing I want to clear up is that I'm an illustrator who works in a comic book style. A lot of people look at my work and they assume I've actually drawn comic books. And because I'm also a comic book historian. And, you know, now I have an MFA degree late in life. So I'm no longer a independent scholar or a self-styled historian. But in a way, all comic book historians were self-styled historians before they ended up getting patted on the head by academia. Same thing with rock and roll music critics. You know, rock and roll music criticism started out in the late 60s written by fans. And then the fans started to work at the newspapers. And that's how rock and roll critics became a, an official part of journalism. So it's the same thing, I think, with any comic book historian. But yeah, I mean, I ended up doing my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, about the 1960s in the field of um, mainstream Marvel and DC comic books. And um, to me, I have every other book about the history of comics. And there's no other book like mine. And that's why it took me 25 years to get published, but it was worth it. And uh, I challenge anyone that's never seen my book to get it and tell me if it doesn't blow your mind. And if it doesn't blow your mind, double your money back if not satisfied. So that's my, that's my claim. So I was like a teenager, like every young comic book fan that starts drawing and becomes interested in art because of comic book art, like a whole generation did, um, that grew up in the 60s like I did during what became known as the Silver Age. There we go, with artists like Steve Ditko and Carmine Infantino and the other six artists in my book um, that I believe, Bill, the same way we look back as art historians at the great Renaissance masters of the human figure like Michelangelo and, and Da Vinci and Raphael. I truly believe 500 years from now, future art historians are going to look back at the giants of the medium that lived in our time who are our Renaissance masters of the human figure. And maybe out of the atomic rubble, they'll find my book and they'll say, hey, this guy knew what was happening at the time. And look, he did this book. So um, where was I going with this? I was saying that, um, oh yeah. So I, I, I think I went through that phase where I thought I would maybe be a comic book artist when I was a teenager. And I ended up going to Rhode Island School Design um, instead of a university with a good art department because of a great comic book artist, Walt Simonson, who is a graduate of RISD. And when he started in the early 70s with that great backup feature in Detective Comics, the Batman title, and it was called Manhunter, that was the feature that made Simonson's bones. And that came out in the fall of 73 when I was a sophomore, yeah, in high school. Just think, I'd never heard of Rodan School Design but in that first letter column, Archie Goodwin, the great late Archie Goodwin, the editor, said, welcome to DC Comics, our new young great artist, Walt Simonson, a recent graduate of Rhode Island School of Design. Because I remember staring at that first Manhunter strip and looking at Walt, this new artist that I had never seen before, Walt Simonson, and I said, this guy has a new style for superheroes that has broken free from what I call the shackles of realism that the great Neil Adams had become the paragon of the previous five years. 
And all the comic artists before Walt Simonson that came into the field, came into the field under the shadow of Neil Adams. But then came Walt Simonson with a very not traditional take on superheroes. His style was scratchier and, and his, his anatomy, but most importantly, the costume design of Manhunter, if you re recall that character, was very different from anything that had ever been done. Simonson was bringing in Japanese influences from, you know, samurai stuff and the weapons and all of that stuff Simonson brought to the table. He, I think, majored in geology or something for four years at a university before he went to RISD. So comic book art has always been elevated when new artists or writers come into the field with what I call real world experience. The reason why Neil Adams and Jim Steranko were the twin gods of comic art in the late 60s is that they brought to comic art influences visually from fields like advertising art and pop art um, that we had never seen before. There we go. The Simonson Manhunter costume, the whole look of it was unlike the boots. Everything about that costume breaks free from any pre-1973 superhero outfit ever. And I remember reading for the first time, wrote on school design. Wow. If they could turn out a guy like Walt Simonson, I'm going to go there. And I ended up going there thinking I would major in illustration and become a quote comic book artist. But when I got to RISD, my freshman year, which they call the foundation year, you begin majoring in your sophomore year, which is, I think, how most four year colleges are. Mm -hmm. Well, during that freshman year, I heard about the graphic design department. I didn't even know what the term graphic design meant. But, you know, I come up out of an age where there were things called commercial artists. I had a good commercial art teacher in high school that taught me things about T-squares and kneaded erasers and rapidographs and stuff like that, but nothing called graphic design. But it turns out graphic design was words and pictures working together. And I was like, that's what comics are, words and pictures working together. That's what great print advertising was, which I grew up with. A great print ad, it was said usually a headline of type and a photograph or an illustration, but mostly photography by that time, they have to work together where if you cover up the headline of type, the picture should not make sense. And if you cover up the picture, the headline should not make sense. They've got to work together. When you read an Alan Moore comic or a Neil Gaiman comic or an Eddie Campbell comic, these are masters off the top of my head of the relationship between word and image and comics. You know, the old EC comics from the 50s, everybody loves them. Oh, they were the greatest illustrated comics ever. Yeah, they were illustrated comics. If you know the way Gaines and Feldstein worked, they were the editors and writers of most of all those science fiction horror stories. They would write the story first, like a traditional DC comic, full script, but then they would actually have the script printed out with that mechanical lettering called Leroy lettering. I guess a guy named Leroy invented it. All caps, and they would print it out and work up the artboards and paste in the copy in already designed panels for the illustrator to just literally fill in the boxes. But here's the problem they were writing descriptions for the illustrator as the text. So the illustrator, like a, a typical EC comic, the text, the caption is so overwritten because the caption is describing the picture verbally. Now that is what I call bad comics. Are they beautifully illustrated? Yeah, Wally Wood, Jack Davis, all those great guys, but who cares? As a comic book reading experience, those EC comics can be painful. The, the mechanical lettering is bad enough. 
There's no human feeling to it. But then the fact that they're overwritten because they're telling the... So you, the reader, are being told by the writer, here is what you're looking at. And then the artist is showing you his version of that. Bad comics. But when you read an Alan Moore comic, a Neil Gaiman, um, the guys, Eddie Campbell, they are geniuses of the, the, the synchronistic yin-yang relationship between word and image. And that is the essence of graphic design. Everything in our, in our world is graphic design. Everything is words and pictures. Everything on the computer is words and pictures. When I do my lectures on comic book history, sometimes I start with the cave paintings at Lascaux in France. And what are those? Sequential images in reduced iconic graphic form, i.e. cartoons, to tell a story, usually an adventure story. And then what happens? A couple millennia later, they put cuneiforms and hieroglyphics, the Egyptians, to sequential images telling a similar story in reduced graphic form into symbols and signs. Well, and then a few millennia later, we get the European broadsides, which were public events and current events drawn out in sequential panels with text telling you what the story's about. And eventually that migrates to America like European immigrants in the late 19th century and start drawing what we know as comic strips, which started out just like movies, sequential images in the late 19th century for the immigrant uneducated masses. American elite criticism thought comics and movies were trash. They were trash entertainment for the, the dumb immigrants who couldn't speak English, so they needed pictures. Well, look how far we've come in basically 100 years where both those art forms are the indigenous American art forms of the 20th century, comics and film. Even though they've got precedence in Europe, they don't take form as American art forms until the, but what is America, but a bunch of <laughs> immigrants from Europe and Asia. And this is why, listen, don't get me started on this political side, but, but this is why these idiot Americans, and I use Americans in quotes, who are anti-immigrant, you're so stupid because what is America? We are the world. Remember the song? We are the world. America is the world because everybody comes to America from the world. That's what America is. That's why we are great. That is what American exceptionalism is earth exceptionalism. Because most of American pop culture was created by the Jewish immigrants like my family that came from Europe. American pop culture is mostly Jews. I do a lecture on Jews and comics. Rod Serling, Twilight Zone, Jew. The person who created the Barbie doll, Jew. The Cheeto, Jew. But we're all immigrants that came from Austria, the Ukraine, and all because of anti-Semitism. <laughs> Hatred. You're not wrong. Drove Europeans. What? You know the famous pilgrims, the Mayflower landing on. What do you think they were leaving Europe for? Because of the Christian Protestant wars that have been going on ever since the Reformation, slaughtering people in the name of Christ over different interpretations of Christ. Oy vey. Literally. <clears throat> but I digress. But I am working on a book about Jews and comics based on one of my lectures that you can find on my YouTube channel that I did at the prestigious 92nd Street Y in New York City a couple years ago, which is a Jewish uh, um, institution. I also do a lecture called Christ and Comics for Jor-El, so loved the earth. He gave his only begotten son with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Hello? <laughs> by the way, also created by Jews. Yeah. So where do you want to go from here? 
By no. the way, Gene Colan, your favorite guy, not that I'm jumping the gun here. <laughs> you know he kept a secret until he died? His real last name? Oh, yeah. Colin! Yeah. yeah. He's he was from the from the priest class. A, a co I'm a Kohane. They were oh, are you? Kohanes. You're descended from your father's side if you're a Kohen. Mm -hmm. They go all the way back to Aaron, yep. Moses' brother, who was the first priest, the first Kohen. And the name Cohen, yes, is a descendant of Kohen. And a court, I remember when I was a kid, my, my father's sisters, because my father died when I was four months old, never forget you're a Kohen. Your father was a Kohen. And that's a very high honor. And ironically, my name, Arlen Aharon, comes from Aaron. And my father's name, Morris, is Moshe, which is Moses. Wow. You like that? I do. I do. Okay. Well, yeah, I, it can't be denied. The uh, I've, I've Wait, actually. By the way, hold on a second. Good. Sure. I didn't finish the story. About oh, I'm sorry. So you, I made, you handed it to me. <laughs> I, I know, but I, put, I just. I'll give it back. <laughs> when you said the whole way, but here's the irony. So I ended up majoring in graphic design, not illustration. Mm. And Risty had a great illustration department. You know, you know the guy that created Jumanji, Chris Van Allsburg? The ch it came from a children's book. If you've never seen the original Jumanji children's book, illustrated and written by a guy named Chris Van Allsburg, he also did Polar Express that became that animated film, remember, by Robert Zemeckis? But if you've mm -hmm. never seen Chris Van Allsburg's children's books, they're not really children's books. They're really adult books that children can also read. Like they're Ace the most Stables. unbelievably illustrated books you've ever seen. And they're very Twilight Zone-esque in their surrealism. And I miss taking him as a teacher because I'm majoring in graphic design. <laughs> but I ended up coming out of art school, going down to New York City, I had a few jobs. I was doing graphics for um, the PBS station in New York. And then I ended up doing the graphics for the David Letterman show. The first year he was on NBC, Late Night with David Letterman. But then um, I ended up working for Neil Adams at Continuity Associates, which was a, a, a dream come true in a way because, again, when I was a kid, when Neil Adams was the god of comp art, and I mean, he's right behind me. You see that image that my finger is on right now? Mm -hmm. For my generation, Neil Adams and Jim Steranko were the twin gods of comic book art. And if you had told me when I was 12 years old, Arlen, one day you will be working for Neil Adams. You will be penciling for him, and he will be inking you. I would have had a 12-year-old adolescent heart attack right there on the street. And yet that's what actually happened to me, is that I ended up working for my childhood idol when I was 25 years old. And it was like going to graduate school, but getting paid for it. My drawing improved 400% in the two years I worked for him. And I knew that once I was done working for Neil Adams, I would be able to be on my own. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but when you're done working for your childhood idol, Bill, who can you work for? Hello? Yourself. That's it. And that's exactly, again, what happened. I've been on my own ever since I left Neil Adams. And um, so ever since then, ironically, I've been making my living being an illustrator, working in a comic book style, but I use my graphic design knowledge and education in every single line I make. My use of typography, my ability to do books and lectures and not just be a visual artist, my ability to write, all these things uh, are really because of my graphic design background in integrating words and pictures. Um, my books are not just books of prose. My books are all about the integration of type and image, whether it's Twilight Zone, whether it's comic book history. Um, and my lectures, my webinars are verbal visual. The visual, is, the verbal is me talking like I'm talking to you now. I don't need notes when I do my lectures. It's all up here. 
And it comes from here, my love for the material. Your background behind you, my background, it's all about love. Every, every one of my webinars or lectures when pre-pandemic, when I used to, do, I called them visual lectures, when I did them live, um, is all about sharing and spreading the love. It's the love I have for the material that influenced me to become an artist. It's the love that I use to share the material and the untold hours that I spend on the webinars, sequencing these images, the amount of images. I show an image for every sentence that I speak. When you come to see my webinar next week on Jack Kirby, you will, you will see how with almost every sentence I speak, I show an image. A lot of people's idea of a lecture, you know, the word lecture is such a pejorative, like you're being lectured to, which in a way you are, but it's such a negative. I was trying to look for a name to describe what I do. There's really no other word other than lecture. I mean, if you say presentation, that could be anything. That could be an exhibition. Um, I'm waiting for a metaphor or a simile for a lecture. I couldn't find one. So I, I call them visual lectures because the word visual ends in an L and the word lecture begins with an L. This is a piece of graphic design. So by joining them as one word, you create a brand name that where the, they share the letter L. So at least it lets people know because most lectures, the stereotype is some man or woman droning on with no public speaking skills, showing an image every 15 minutes, you know, not mine. Mine are the exact opposite. And um, people have to experience my stuff to believe it because I've been going to comic conventions and anything public about comic history my whole life, Bill. And if I told you, I've always been shocked and saddened at how poorly such a visual medium like comics would have such poorly produced and designed visual presentations. Well, anybody listening to this um, show of yours that's never seen me, but people who have seen me will know exactly what I'm talking about. Nobody presents pop culture, whether it's comics, Twilight Zone, Bruce Springsteen, you name it all the things that I do lecture on, like the way I do it. And nobody does it with my verbal component. Um, but anyway, all of that comes out of, so I've been able to become a both graphic designer, although I've never done graphic design full time, but I use my graphic design knowledge. And I have, you know, this book is graphic design. I, there's no illustrations. That's Jack Kirby's art. But my design ability, you know, to take his interview and typeset it and integrate it with the image. So it's Kirby himself talking about the artwork as you're going through the pages. You know, this is a collage of Kirby's collages. You see that there's you're looking at a comp cover, two collages and then the background. But then you see all his word balloons. I took out the original text and that's Jack Kirby talking about how he created those collages. So you read my book like a giant comic book, but it's an art book and a history book as well. There's no other book like mine, but I learned all of this as a graphic designer, manipulating these images with text as nobody else has. And I do that with my material about the twilight zone. Here's my coffee table book. And it's the same thing. All right, let me get to. There you see, each man measures his time. Some with joy, some with hope, some with fear. Now that text is narration from one episode. Those are two different episode images. And I've integrated the text with the images. And then, like peeling an onion, if you know the episodes these images come from, then the text, which comes from a third episode, each man measures his time, 
some with hope, some with joy, some with fear. That's exactly what these men are doing in those pictures. So if you don't know anything about the episodes, if I've done my job well as a graphic designer, Bill, this double page spread should make sense on a pure graphic design level, mm. right? You don't have to know what these episodes are about, but one guy looks like he's about to get run over by a car and the other guy is holding a clock like his life depended on it. <laughs> I remember the first one is um, Time Enough at Last. Was that episode two? Yeah. I think that was the second episode. No. It was Burgess Meredith, though, right? Yeah, but it wasn't the second episode, but it was early. It was, I think, the 10th episode or 9th of the 12th. Tenth, okay. Yeah, yeah. something early. early on. Fall of 1959 when it debuted. Best episode ever. Even though that could potentially be a cookbook, that yeah. was the best episode ever. <laughs> uh, you know why it's remembered that way? is because of the cruelty of the ending. Yeah. Where you've been made by the storytellers to feel sympathy Remember his wife, how horrible she was? Yeah. Okay. Everyone around him. You think Henry Bemis, the Burgess Meredith character, quote, deserved his fate? No. Okay. But that's, no, that's what, what was so cruel. But that's what gives the episode the memorability. It's a bit of a schadenfreude. People love cruelty. The fact is, while that is a Rod Serling script, it is not a Rod Serling story. Serling was a master adapter of prose short stories to television. That's so many of the greatest Twilight Zone episodes are adaptations, and many of those are by Serling. Time Enough at Last is a short story written by somebody named Lynn Venable. And that's her ending, which is, if you know the laws of storytelling, is a violation of the implicit pact a storyteller makes with its audience, that if I'm going to present a character to you for you to identify sympathetically with or empathetically with, which is what Henry Bemis is for the first, you know, 25 and a half minutes of the episode, the wife alone, the horrible shrew of a wife that rips up his book of poetry. Are you kidding me? If that doesn't get you sympathy for Henry Bemis, the rest of the episode is moot. Mm. And yet she cruelly, and I use the word cruel, takes away his ability to read at the end. It's why everybody remembers the episode and calls it the greatest. But I believe if that had been Serling's original story, I think with his worldview, I think he would have ended it with Bemis reading those books as the camera pulls away. And the music plays us out and we fade to the stars. But it would not have been as remembered. But we remember it for its cruelty. And we're still debating on these Internet Twilight Zone boards. Did Henry Bemis deserve his fate? And you want to know what's interesting? The people who think he did deserve his fate? Oh, well, he was antisocial and he was a hermit. And he kept to himself. He didn't interact with society. So he deserved his fate. I'm just telling you, that is the prevailing, the wow. 50% who believe that. So I find it interesting that time enough at last is always held in high esteem. And you prove my point. And yet, um, like I said, uh, it's a very cruel ending. And human beings going back to the Roman Colosseum, we love our cruelty, don't we? We do. I'm calling you out on your cruelty, Bill. I'm cool with it. <laughs> you're, you're cruel with that? Is that what you said? No, I'm, I'm, no, no. I said I'm cool with that, but oh, that hey, would hey, be a good pun. That's cruel to me. That would be a good pun. I, no. I cannot claim authorship. The only that, good though. pun is a bad pun. You know that. Of course. <laughs> I leave so, no pun unturned. <laughs> nice try. Nice. So, try. You know, I succeed when you try. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be the 50%. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> so we've done so much of this. You know what? I honestly just kind of want to keep going with this. Listen, for the sake of the audience, I know that we were, well, my plan was originally, hey, Halloween is coming up. Let's talk about Tomb of Dracula and stuff like that. But 
honestly, Arlen's got a show coming up in case nobody saw all this stuff down here. By the way, I follow Arlen on Twitter. I expect everybody to go and check out Arlen. I'm barely on Twitter. I'm mostly on Facebook because I need more than 140 characters, as you can get a sense of. Um, I mostly like interacting on Facebook, but, you know, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Like, I don't get enough feedback on Twitter and Instagram. That's not what Twitter is for. I'm just letting you know, Mm -hmm. you know, you can follow me on Twitter. You follow me on Instagram, but mostly friend me on Facebook. And by the way, I'm in Facebook jail for the next three weeks for posting something anti he who shall not be named and who will be voted out of office. Hopefully, if there is a God, by the time you're watching this beautiful show we're putting together. Did I say that succinctly enough? Uh, it was pretty but clear. Either way, friend me on Facebook. I run three comics history groups, one on Jack Kirby, one on Neil Adams, and one on the Silver Age, the era of my book. But yeah, I would love to talk about my webinar coming up about Kirby and the 50th anniversary of the New Gods because it's very present. You know, they're going to make a movie of the New Gods. I don't know if people know that, but the up and coming, and not up and coming, she's here, but the fact that they gave a big budget, multiple character superhero story with mostly male characters to not only a female director, because Patty Jenkins of the Wonder Woman's movies has broken that mold, thank mm-hmm. God, but a director of color, Ava DuVernay, this new famous director, she agreed to direct New Gods. And when I say soon to be a major motion picture, below, it's being blocked now by the text, but underneath, not only was the new gods created by Jack Kirby and an inspiration for Star Wars, I mean, if you know anything about, well, let me just give people a little background. Jack Kirby, whether you know it or not, created the entire Marvel Universe almost single-handedly. Not Stan Lee. And again, we could do a whole show about the whole Stan Lee problem. But suffice it to say, not only am I on Team Kirby, not only have I done some major works, but to make a long story short for people that think Stan Lee created the Marvel Universe Foundation characters and stories, all the what I call the forensic comic book evidence, you know, The bad thing about comics in the 20th century is that they were not documented as history the way rock and roll and movies and other art forms of the 20th century have been documented. Barely any real comic book history exists that we can look at and and listen to and read descriptions of. All we can do as, quote, historians, Bill, is sift through what I call the forensic comic book evidence, which means we can tell that Jack Kirby had a 20-year career before he teams up with Stan Lee in the late 50s. And what did he do in those 20 years? He not only drew, but he created and co-created characters with his partner, Joe Simon, one of them being a little-known character called Captain America. In the 50s, they create an entire genre of romance comics. Enough said to quote (laughs) he who shall not be named. Another one, although I've already named him. Yes. In the 50s, they create romance comics. Well, by the end of the 50s, Kirby, freelancer, is looking for work. He ends up going to tiny. They weren't even called Marvel comics. They were called Atlas comics. And he's doing these. The point is. Kirby, prior to hooking up with Stan Lee, wrote his own stories, created characters, created entire genres. That is what the forensic comic evidence shows. Stan Lee had a 20-year career before hooking up with Jack Kirby as a so-called writer slash editor. What does the forensic comic evidence show? Can you name a single memorable Stan Lee story from before 1961? And I'll give you the answer, Bill. It's no. Can you name a any significant character Stan Lee created 
that has stood the test of time like Captain America or romance comics? The answer, no. Yet, we are expected to believe, Bill, that somehow overnight in 1961, Stan Lee becomes this creative comics genius. That over the next nine years, coincidentally, the nine years that he worked with Kirby, he becomes the so-called alleged creator of the Marvel Comics universe of characters and foundational stories. And what is Jack Kirby known for during that nine-year stretch? Boy, could that guy draw. Man, could he draw anything. Boy, Jack Kirby could draw. He was such a good drawer. What artists call a pair of hands, if you've worked in the commercial art field, artists were referred to by account executives, by clients. We need a pair of hands, meaning we need somebody to draw this up. But we're the idea men. That's who Stan Lee thought he was. But what does the forensic comic book evidence show, Bill? Jack Kirby drew his stories out for Stan Lee like silent movies on paper. He put margin notes for what the characters should be saying, what the caption boxes should be reading. Handed 20 pages like that to Stan Lee. And then Stan Lee filled in the captions and the word balloons, which in his own words he described as like filling in a crossword puzzle. Think about it. Now, why was this done this way? The old traditional DC Comics way was a writer wrote up what was called a full script. You know, panel one, crime commits in Gotham City. Panel two, Commissioner Gordon shows the bat signal. Panel three, Bruce Wayne is in bed with Dick Grayson somehow. And, you know, Alfred, trust me, there were panels like that. They were actually in bed together. And Alfred comes to them and says, you're wanted by Commissioner Gordon. I'm not making that up. And I wish I had the graphic to show you. But there is an, a panel. But I digress. I remember. What I'm trying to make is that's how comics were done. And then the artists, like a screenplay for a movie. And then the artists would get the script, just like the Bill Gaines Feldstein, except it wasn't printed out on the page of them to draw boxes. But the artists would interpret that script. And if the script called for six panels, okay. But in the same way movies were declared by the 1950s French film critics called the auteur theory of film, that just because a screenplay writer writes a screenplay, that doesn't mean he's the author of the movie because a director is the real author of the movie, auteur in French, because a director looks at these words on paper and has to figure out, how do I make that into a movie? Without a director figuring that out, a screenplay is words on paper. Every I ended up doing 10 years ago a verbal visual essay, member verbal visual graphic design, called the auteur theory of comics. And I did it almost like an amicus brief for the Kirby estate to go to court with because they were fighting Disney over rights to the Marvel characters. And I basically use the auteur theory of film and translate it to comics saying just because a comic book writer like the old DC comics writers panel one tells an artist what to draw. The artist is the auteur of every comic book reading experience. Why? Because if you gave a panel description that you think is as clear as clear can be man walks in door. And you gave that bill to 10 different artists. Guess what? You would get 10 different ways of showing a man coming through a door. Now, I mentioned Alan Moore before. Alan Moore is famous or infamous for typewriting 25 pages of description for one panel for Dave Gibbons to draw into the Watchmen. 25 pages, single space, of everything in that panel in Alan Moore's imagination. But again, if you gave that to 10 different artists, guess what? You'd still get 10 different images. So Jack Kirby was the creator. Based on the comic forensic evidence, 
that the legions of Lee Lemmings, as I call them, don't want to face. But if I could have presented in court in favor of the Kirby estate, I would have presented a verbal visual visual lecture, which I've done at comic called the author theory of comics, proving by using the forensic comic that Stan Lee did not have the creative capacity based on the comic book historical forensic evidence to have created anything. Characters, stories, and yet Kirby has a 20-year forensic history. You know, I compare this to imagine a crime story. It could be a film, it could be a TV show, it could be a book. But imagine a scene where the police are looking for a guy who's killed 25 people, serial murder. And they come up with two suspects. One of them has a totally clean record, never committed a crime in his life. The other suspect has committed like 50 murders prior and somehow got out of jail and escaped death. But he's got a, a previous like nobody's business. Ergo, he had to have committed these 25 murders, right? What happens in my allegorical story? The police arrest the guy with a totally spotless record. That is the Stan Lee, Jack Kirby analog. That is a great analogy. Thank you. And I call what Stan Lee committed the art crime of the 20th century. And while that sounds grandiose... If you know about the Big Eye paintings that they made a movie out of called Big Eyes by Walter Keene in the 60s, they were very kitsch. All these paintings on black velvet of children with big eyes. It was a big fad in the 60s and early 70s. And they were supposedly painted by an artist named Walter Keene, K-E-A-N-E. -E. And Tim Burton made a movie about 10 years ago called Big Eyes. Why? Because it turns out his wife did all the paintings and he took all the credit. Wow. The guy couldn't draw a line in his life. And in the end, there's this fabulous court scene, spoiler alert, where the judge puts a canvas and paints in front of each, the wife and the husband and says, okay, whoever can paint a big eyes painting in 30 minutes is going to win this case. Walter Keene sat there and couldn't make a mark. And at the end of 30 minutes, the wife had a finished big eye. So this gets back to the story of Jack Kirby and the, and the new gods. Why? Because Kirby finally leaves Marvel Comics in 1970, which was the pop, color, pop culture comic book equivalent of the Beatles breaking up. That's how big the news was that Kirby who everybody knew was the force behind Marvel, even though Stan Lee was billed as the writer, editor. It was Kirby's artwork that blew everybody's minds. Comics are primarily a visual medium. You know, Stan, if you want to say you created Spider-Man, not Steve Ditko, the artist, and you had written a book in 1962 called Spider-Man by Stan Lee, then fine. In the medium of prose, you are the creator. But in a medium called comic books, which is words and pictures, remember? Until an artist puts a pencil to paper and figures out how to take your script, or what if it's not a script? What if it's a synopsis? What if it's just a phone call that, according to the urban comic book legend, Bill, Stan Lee made to Jack Kirby in the summer of 65 and said, hey, Jack, how about if the Fantastic Four fight a really big villain next issue? Like the biggest you've ever done. And what does Kirby do over the weekend in his little basement, Long Island, you know, three-bedroom house in which the whole Marvel Universe was created? He creates the Galactus Silver Surfer trilogy. But you know what the credits in the trilogy read? Written by Stan Lee. Penciled by Jack Kirby. Penciled. He's a pair of hands. 
who drew up Stan Lee's brilliant ideas. Art crime of the 20th century. So he leaves Marvel in 1970 to go to rival DC Comics, which was like Coke Pepsi. And what does he do for DC? He creates this brand new concept, never before done in comics, of four interlocking independent comic book series called The Fourth World, in which each of the comics tells an independent story, but it's, it's all one big story where they're all interlocked. So ahead of its time that it didn't sell well. DC didn't promote it right. There's a whole story behind it, which I'm going to go into in my webinar next week. But suffice it to say, like so many works of genius in the history of art, sometimes they're not popularly successful when they come out. Gee, Van Gogh never sold a painting. So Jack Kirby's Fourth World series, of which the New Gods were the primary title, they were all New Gods, so to speak. Because Kirby had created gods for Marvel. Thor was a god. Galactus was a god. And he wanted new gods, but he had these ideas for years. Once he saw Stan Lee taking credit for his creations, he kept those ideas to himself. And when he went to DC Comics, he gave them the ideas that he didn't want to give to Stan Lee and Marvel. Well, they were discontinued before they were even two years published. And yet, like so many great works of art, they ended up becoming greater in death, so to speak, than they were in life. They influenced an entire new generation of Kirby fans who were not old enough to have been influenced by the Marvel decade. But they were young enough where Kirby's DC material the fourth world became their Kirby. Now, Ava DuVernay, black female director, why did she direct in the New Gods? Because somebody asked her once what her favorite comic book was or character. And she said, I love the Jack Kirby character named Big Barda. Now, who was Big Barda? Big Barda was like an Amazon. I mean, not built demure like the Invisible Woman, which is another one of Kirby's creations of the Fantastic Four, but built like a true Amazon and decked out in the classic Jack Kirby iconic costume. And she's a white woman. All of Kirby's characters are white. Oh, did I mention Jack Kirby created the black superhero, Black Panther, for Marvel that people think Stan Lee created? But yet when he got to the New Gods, he only creates one black character, a kind of a knockoff of the Silver Surfer called the Black Racer. So the surfer was on a surfboard. The Black Racer was on, get this, skis. Oh, yeah, like there's so many black people skiing, just like there's so many black people skating, right? That's the stereotype. So Kirby in the early 70s gives us a black skier who can fly on skis. And he's also like a master of death. You know, every white bigot's nightmare, a black man on skis <laughs> flying after them with the power to kill them. Isn't that every white racist nightmare? I digress. Okay. That's part of my new stand-up act I'm doing, you know, about comics and uh, <laughs> politics and whatever. I digress. <laughs> okay. So the fourth world over the next five decades the characters get interpreted by other artists and writers. Everybody wants to take their stab at Kirby's characters and it keeps them alive because everybody loved them. Even though DC comics in their infinite wisdom cancel. Oh, and you're ready for this little digression. Carmine Infantino, the great DC comics artist who created the red suited flash. And I've done lectures and webinars on him. He was the publisher at the time, the first artist to become the publisher of a comic book company. You know, now Joe Casada, great artist, is also the editor-in-chief or whatever of Marvel. That's the only time that's ever happened in 50 years of a comic book artist becoming the executive head of a comic book company. So it was under Infantino's leader. He brought Kirby to D.C. He used his leverage. Great coup, right, Infantino? You bring... Okay, so... 
here's the problem. The books weren't selling. They were losing money. And Infantino claims he had to make the decision to discontinue them because they weren't selling. So flash forward a couple decades after that decision, and I'm interviewing Infantino for one of my comics history projects. And I said, Carmine, I've always heard that the Kirby books were losing money and you had to cancel them. Can you tell me how much money they were losing? Now, remember, this is $1972. I was expecting, and let me ask you something, Bill. How much money do you think each Kirby book was losing in 1972 dollars for them to discontinue? Remember, this is the king of comics who single-handedly built Marvel that beat DC, the established giant. They bring him over. It's like the king. It's like when Hearst stole everybody from one paper to bring to the other. And Hertz and Pulitzer, they hired each other's. It was in Citizen Kane, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay. How much money would you wager, pun intended, that the Kirby books lost in 1972 dollars? Three years before I was born, so I'm going to go by a percentage. I'm going to say, in order for me to think that it was losing money enough to be canceled, and, and making that 30 Kirby, and not just any schmuck, mm. you're going to cancel the guy who you brought over. Okay, how much? I would say it would have to be making at least 30% less than Batman and or Superman. Give me a number figure. Uh, Throw out a money figure. Uh, I, just make would, up something. Let's say thirty thousand. I twenty the back then. Per I don't book. know ten thousand per book. Per oh per book. I I don't know how to do that. Neither do I. But just take a guess. <laughs> so you're saying like what per like money wise? What what do you think I'm talking about? Monopoly chips. <laughs> let's go with said money. They were losing. They were losing. Let's say it's like a game show. I know. Throw out a figure. It may believe this is comic book Jeopardy, Alex. I'll take Jack Kirby for 400. The <laughs> amount of money, let's say, Kirby and Fourth were lost in order for them to be discontinued within two years of their initial publication. How much within, money? Within that two years, I'd say they'd have to have been losing at least $10,000 per book. Yeah. Okay. Is that your yeah, thought? So, so, yeah. So, per Miracle book. Man, New Gods. Okay. $10,000 uh, a book. Mm hmm. In 1972 dollars, not ten thousand dollars in 2020 dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bill. The reason why I asked you this, and I'm sorry I had to put you through the ringer to come up with an answer, but I'm glad you did because, in my own mind, and I know nothing about finances, I know nothing about how business works, but I assumed it was a multi-thousand dollar figure of some height. Enough to cancel Kirby's magnum opus that you brought him over for. You know what Infantino told me when I interviewed him? This was back in like 1999 or something. Now you're going to take a guess how much money they were actually losing for them to cancel the books. Five. I wish I could summon that clock ticking music that Howard Stern always uses when he asks a guest a question. Dun, 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 Let's dun, just do the Alice Trebek thing. Let's say uh, 500 bucks per title. Exactly. That's exactly what it was? Exactly. Now, <laughs> imagine Bill, when he told me that with a straight face, he goes, Arlen, each book was losing $500 a month. Bill, I looked at Infantino and I said, Carmine, are you kidding me? There were fans who would have paid you $500 a month to keep the books running. If he had said 5,000 a month, I would have believed it. They discontinued Kirby's magnum opus over $500 a book. You like that? That's ridiculous. Thank you. So, the bottom line is, what did Kirby end up producing? He did produce his magnum opus. Years later, Star Wars would come out. And instead of, what is what is Star Wars and Lucas? By the way, George Lucas worked in a comic book store in San Francisco in the early 70s. 
He was a comic book fan. You don't think he was reading Kirby? <laughs> Why do you think? So in Star Wars, we have something called the Force. May the Force be with you. What do we have in Kirby's New Gods? The Source. Kirby has Apocalypse, which is this circular world of evil. It looks just like the Death Star. Mm. Darth Vader, the big villain, looks like what? You got to go. Can I stop you for no, for one second. I, I wouldn't do that to you. So $31,150 today. That's the inflation rate. $31,000. So are you saying they were justified in canceling? You're, you're a Jersey guy. I'm a Jersey guy. You've seen Eddie in the cruisers, right? Yeah, why? So uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie goes and makes Season in Hell, which is way before its time. Afterwards, after he fakes his death, suddenly this becomes the most popular thing ever. Like nobody could have expected this was going to be this genius. It was so far ahead of its time. And that is what the new gods. Yeah, but I'm asking, no, 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 no. But when you brought up the money figure, mm -hmm. by saying it's the equivalent of 30,000. Yeah, today, which no, would, let's no, say, no, but what do comic point. books lose today? No, you're missing my point. Okay. You're basically saying nowadays, if a book was losing $30,000, um, they would discontinue it. So what you're basically saying is Infantino was justified because $500 back then was the equivalent of 30000 now. So it was a lot of money back then. No. What do books make back then compared to today? Are the books today even making as much as they were making back in the 90s? Let me say that. The lowest selling – no. Let me word it the other way. The biggest selling comic book today by Marvel or DC – would be discontinued in the 60s or 70s for low sales. That's how bad things have gotten. Even though comics have taken over the culture, superhero movies on television, the comic books are being read less and less. And that's for a lot of reasons, which we could do a whole show about. And if you ever want to talk about why we have this bittersweet thing with comics and the culture now, I mean, there are toys that you can buy now in stores on the back of your wall that we only dreamed about when we were kids. And yet nobody's buying the comic books themselves anymore. They're, they're only being kept alive by the conglomerates that own them because they need to keep them published to secure the copyrights and trademarks for the licensing money, which is where the money is. So it's ironic. You can get a action figure of a comic book character that they can't even publish his comic book because it doesn't sell enough. But you can buy the action figure. And Jack Kirby didn't want to go into toy stores because he couldn't bear to see his characters on the wall yep. that he was not getting a percentage of. And that Stan Lee was being given creative credit. Do you know Layman? Layman thinks Stan Lee was also the artist as well. <laughs> You know, London, London had an art exhibition about five years ago called Posters of Marvel Comics. Maybe it wasn't the exact title, but it was an exhibition of framed posters of Marvel Comics characters. And who was given creative credit for the posters that were all illustrated by different artists? Stan Lee. Layman went to an exhibition of Marvel posters thinking they were created and illustrated by Stan Lee. So when I tell you the Lee Lemmings outnumber us Kirby commandos like the Jedi Knights outnumber, I mean like the clones outnumber the Jedi Knights. Mm -hmm. That is what we Kirby commandos are up against where even comic book pros as well as fans think Stan Lee created everything. And it's a very sad situation. Now, maybe with the New Gods movie coming out in two years, which is all Kirby, there doesn't have to be a mention of Stanley, uh, will even the, the, the playing field. And then you want to know in the, in the definition, as Rod Serling might say, file it under eye for irony, that Marvel, Disney, is making a big budget movie to compete with the New Gods called The Eternals. And who are The Eternals? Well, going back to Jack Kirby, 
after Kirby was at D.C. for five years, from 70 to 75, two years into it, they discontinue his magnum opus. He hangs around another three years, giving them kind of hack work, a couple of interesting concepts. Typical Kirby, you know, but he leaves in 75. And what does he do? He goes back to Marvel Comics. It's like Marvel 2.0. And what does he do when he gets there? One of the titles he creates for them is called The Eternals. And it's basically another version of the new gods mixed with Charity of the Gods, kind of. And, um, you know, it's a lesser work of Kirby's, but it's interesting. It had some great artwork, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But because he created it as a freelancer for Marvel Comics, they own it. Just like DC owns the new gods and Mr. Miracle and all those characters. So it is very ironic that 50 years after their publication, 25 years after Kirby's death, in which he died, never knowing about the settlement that his estate would settle for a couple of years ago, instead of going to the Supreme Court, where the case between a freelancer who brought ideas to a company and the company would be fought out and whoever won would set a precedent because the previous legal rights, which is why the Kirby state always lost was that if a freelancer brought an idea to a company, the company, because they were paying the freelancer owns the concept. Well, that's been challenged over the recent years and many lesser court cases have decided in favor of the freelancer in the same way that the black blues men whose songs were stolen from them in what are called onerous contracts. Listen, Siegel and Schuster sold the first 10 pages of Superman, the first story in action comics for $130, $13 a page. But in those days, it was, it was the way business was done. If a publisher bought material to publish, by virtue of them paying you, they owned all the rights in perpetuity. Siegel and Schuster wound up decades later penniless. The creators of Superman. The co-creator of Batman, Bill Finger, who did more to create Batman than Bob Kane did. But Bob Kane, just like Stan Lee, screwed his partner. And Bill Finger died penniless, alone, unmourned, and unloved in a one-room New York apartment in 1974. Well, I do live for another 25 years, just like Stan Lee lived 25 years after Kirby, went around. I created everything. I created everything. So did Bob Kane. I've done many projects for Bill Finger. And thanks to a writer named Mark Tyler Nobleman, they ended up making a documentary, and I was filmed for the documentary called Bill and Me, I think. If you've never seen it, it's on Hulu. It's excellent. Not because I'm in it for 15 seconds, <laughs> but they really do. And it has a happy ending because Bill Finger's lawyers a couple of years ago were able to successfully persuade DC Comics, who pulled out, but, you know, we have a contract that Bob Kane is the sole creator, blah, 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 blah. Well, again... This is what courts were doing these last couple of years. So everybody was hoping that the Kirby estate, it was going to go to the Supreme Court on a Monday morning a couple of years ago. And this time the Kirby estate had what are called amicus briefs, which means friends of the court. These Hollywood creative guilds wrote amicus briefs for the Kirby estate saying that we believe Kirby is the creator of the Marvel Comics characters. Yes, he was a freelancer, but so are we. And we have rights that when we work for a company, if we bring an idea to the company, we must have a piece of that. Yeah. And everybody was hoping the Kirby estate had lost many previous court cases, but never before the Supreme Court. Well, Bill, guess what happened on the Friday at five o'clock before the Monday? You mean before the weekend when they weren't allowed to go in and say, we'd like to settle and just please shh. So here's what I think happened. Of course, the minute we all got the news that the Kirby estate took the settlement, 
which was rumored because they couldn't reveal the details. 20 million, 80 million, nobody knows. But uh, bottom line is Disney blinked. They were afraid to go to the Supreme Court, which should have told the Kirby estate. We were all hoping the Kirby estate would not take the settlement and take it to, because if they had won in the Supreme Court bill, it would have set a precedent for so many other freelancers. But then we thought, can you blame the Kirby estate? Jack's been dead since 94. Who knows how much money they have? They got a big family. If you're going to dangle even 20 million in front of them, can you blame them for not taking $20 million? But I believe had they fought and won in the Supreme Court, it would have been 20 billion. Because you know to these conglomerates, $20 million is one weekend in box office receipts. But Bill, here's what I think happened. I think Friday afternoon, the lawyers for Disney got a phone call from the lawyers for Warner Brothers, which owns DC and Batman. And here's what I think happened. I think that lawyer from Warner Brothers said to the Disney lawyer, hey, schmucko, if you don't settle with the Kirby's and you go to the Supreme Court and lose, guess what? We're going to have to give half a Batman to Athena Finger, the granddaughter of Bill Finger. I bet you, Bill, that the Warner Brothers lawyers offered to chip in a couple million to the settlement. <laughs> we'll give you 10 million, but you better settle with them, you idiots. You know, I'm not, a, happen. I'm not a fan of conspiracy theories, but that that Sorry. makes more sense than even the grassy knoll. Thank you. Thank you. Because I'm telling you, man, Batman is the most popular superhero in the world. Yeah. Once again, throw out a figure for how much you think Batman is worth monetarily. No, you can't. You can't. But I'm just saying it's in the billions now. Half of yeah. that would have gone to Athena Finger. Yeah. So this is a roundabout way of saying my webinar next week on Jack Kirby's the 50th anniversary of the new gods will not only show you the influence on Star Wars alone. Darth Vader, you know, one of the new gods, they all carry around the little thing they call a mother box. What is it? It's an iPhone <laughs> created 50 years earlier by Jack Kirby. These are all things I'll be showing in the webinar next week. Why it was not only ahead of its time, like great art is, why it was not appreciated in its time. And we'll talk about what might happen with the movie. And she picked an interesting screenwriter, a guy that's writing the Mr. Miracle title presently for DC, which is a deconstruction of Mr. Miracle. So nobody knows, like any movie, whether it's going to be successful or not, but it is an interesting director choice, Ava DuVernay, a, a woman, a black woman directing, you know, the ultimate, you know, the white God story, so to speak. <laughs> um, I wonder if she'll have the black racer. That'll be funny. But like everything now, black actors are playing, quote, white characters because that's the way it is. Back in the day, every character was white. I mean, can you blame people for saying, so what? Make a character black once in a while. So that's what's going to happen. I think male characters are going to become female characters and vice versa, but who cares? As long as it says Jack Kirby, you know, we'll be happy. But just remember, Kirby dies in 1994 at the age of 77. Whether you believe in an afterlife or not, whether Kirby's smiling down on us, who knows? But we do know that he died a broke. I met him. In the summer of 93, six months before he died. And I had met him previously in 1975, 20 years earlier. And he was still robust. I guess he was in his mid-50s. Well, when I saw him in the summer of 70 of 93, he looked like a fragile, feeble, broken man. And Paul McCartney is 77 and still rocking out on stage. You know, so again, whether Jack and I'm just telling you in my mind, 
he was killed by Stan Lee stealing his creations and Kirby having to live through it. I think Carmen Infantino killed Jack Kirby by prematurely decapitating his magnum opus over $500 a book. Even in 1972 dollars, there were fans who would have paid DC Comics $500 to keep the books published. Individual fans in 1972 would have paid DC $500. For the amount of advertising they did, Kirby is coming, Kirby is coming, you'd figure they'd have a little tiny okay. bit more foresight. Okay. Why don't we end on this conspiracy theory that you're going to love even more than the other one? In my opinion, and my tongue is only half in my cheek when I tell you this, I believe DC Comics management above Infantino brought Kirby in on purpose in order to make him fail, to punish him for defeating them in the 1960s. I believe that like the Trojan horse, I believe they drew, well, maybe not like the Trojan horse, but I believe like wolves and sheep, they drew Kirby in. Come to DC, Jack, we love you. Even though you beat us single-handedly for a decade. Oh, but we'll give you whatever you want. You want to edit your own books? Great. Yeah. Jack, we love you. Look, we'll take out house ads. Once they got Kirby in their fold, if you look at the way the books were published and the advertising or lack thereof, they set Kirby up to fail. They did not promote him as the king once he got there. Yeah. They did format changes. They didn't give him the formats they wanted. They, I'm telling you, again, if you look at it on the pure forensic comic evidence, I believe DC Comics, and again, there's more backstory. Not only did Kirby beat them at Marvel, but Kirby used to be at DC in the late 50s, and he had a famous argument with an editor there named Jack Schiff over this comic strip they were doing on the side called Sky Masters about astronauts. And it ended up going to court, and Kirby lost. Jack Schiff won. They were fighting over ownership of the strip or money or whatever, and Kirby lost. But he was blackballed from DC. That's why he went to Marvel and ended up creating the Marvel Universe. So imagine the irony that by the end of the 60s, Marvel is now number one. DC, the former industry giant, has been relegated like they are no longer the industry giant. How do you think Jack Schiff was no longer at DC, but many of the other higher ups were still there? How do you, you know, even though we think of corporations as faceless, they're still run by individual idiots and assholes. How do you think the DC higher ups thought about Jack Kirby, a guy that they kicked out <coughs> because they defended Jack Schiff? And then Kirby goes to the competition which were literally on death's door, Atlas Comics, and resurrects them single-handedly and ends up beating them by the end of the decade. And then you're telling me they brought him in to let him do his magnum opus. And then what happens, Bill? Within two years, they prematurely decapitate it, in my opinion, and this can never be proved. I believe they brought him in intentionally. They were willing to take the $500 a month loss in order to basically corporately punish Kirby. And corporations are capable of doing that. They've done it to individuals through the courts, through lawsuits. DC decided, hey, hey, Carmine. The DC higher-ups thought Carmine was a dumb Italian from Brooklyn. And I'm not making this up. Hmm. He was their pawn. Hey, Carmine, you're friends with Kirby, right? Oh, yeah, guys. 
thanks for letting me run DC Comics. I know you think I'm a dumb idiot. I'm uneducated. But thank you for making me publisher. What do you want me to do, boss? You want me to go get Jack Kirby to bring him to DC? Sure, boss. I don't know what accent I'm using. It ain't an Italian Brooklyn accent. Not Italian. <laughs> I, I kind of give you, they thought Infantino was basically a dumb, a dumb artist. So they got Infantino to lure Kirby in. They seem to give Kirby all the tools to the toolbox. And then the moment he starts using them, they start cutting him. What do they call that when you cut at the knees? At the knees, yeah. At the knees. In my opinion, creatively, Kirby's work after the fourth world is discontinued never has the same spark again. Now, Kirby, if it's not, oh, but what about OMAC? And what about the Eternals? And what about this? And what? Listen, he still did some good artwork. He still had some decent ideas. But in my opinion, if the aliens came down and said, we have room on our spaceship for a little bit of work about Kirby, I ain't giving them anything after 1972. Sorry. He said plainly when he came back to Marvel, he says, I am not giving them another Silver Surfer. That's what they want, but they're not getting it. But DC, my point is, mm -hmm. the fourth world was Kirby's magnum opus. When they took it away from him, they succeeded in my conspiracy theory of, of punishing him and, and crushing his soul. Kirby's work, not only was never the same again, but he lived for only 22 more years. And he died a broken man. So guess what, DC? You succeeded. And Marvel 2.0 treated him like shit there too. But who cares? He wasn't giving them their magnum opus, but he gave DC his magnum opus. And I'm telling you, man, as much as my tongue is in cheek about this, I believe uh, that my theory of DC bringing him in intentionally to fail has plenty of validity. I'm sorry. I'll argue it. And I'm going to argue it next week on my webinar. And the day before my webinar, I have a radio show on blogtalkradio.com. It's a little hard to find, but it's called nightlight radio and nightlight has a hyphen. And when you go to blog talk radio and do a search for nightlight radio, you'll find my show. I've been scheduling these two hours of internet radio time before each of my webinars ever since the end of August and continuing into November to discuss with an expert on each subject. Next week on Wednesday, the day before the webinar, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be doing my nightlight radio show with a guy named Mark Evanier. Mark Evanier is now in his late 60s, but 50 years ago, he was Jack Kirby's assistant on his fourth world titles. And ever since then, he became a writer on his own. He's got a, he's in Hollywood. He has a lot of pop culture credits, but I'm proud to say I've known him for years and he's going to be my guest on my nightlight radio show on Wednesday night. And we're going to talk about my conspiracy theory and see whether there's any validity because Mark Evanier was there interacting with DC Comics at the time. And I just believe as a corporation, they had the ability to do what I'm describing. And they would be willing to take those mo money losses of a couple of thousand dollars, which to a corporation is nothing. In order, look, look what we did to Kirby. Ha ha, we fucked you, Kirby. For anybody who thinks that maybe – see, I don't know how much yet I completely buy into your theory, but they did bring him into uh, – what was it? A Jimmy Olsen uh, – Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. What was it? Issue 132? Three. 33. That's where they introduced Darkseid. Uh, on top of that, they um, – at the end well, of the day – Wait, what's your point about the Jimmy Olsen title? Well, not exactly the biggest title to no, no, no. Bring, hold on. Like, dark side into. Wait, wait, but let's not be misleading. Uh -huh. When Kirby negotiated with Infantino, uh -huh. he said, I want to do these titles. But then Kirby said, Jack, we want you to do one of our titles as well. Uh -huh. 
pick anything you want. Kirby came from the Depression. He would never have picked a title that had a steady artist on it. DC wanted him to do Superman or they wanted him to do whatever. So he picked Jimmy Olsen? He said, what is one of your lowest selling titles? They said Jimmy Olsen, which by the way, even at the time, Jimmy Olsen was still outselling most of Marvel's. Most, you know, Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane, all during the 60s, were outselling every Marvel title. That's how big the Superman titles were. But, but in 1970, Jimmy Olsen was on its last legs. Mm. So was Lois Lane. Mm -hmm. And Kirby said, give me Jimmy Olsen, let me play with it. And that's how that happened. Cool. Okay. So one, I'm going to give you credit for calling me out because I appreciate that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of us comic YouTubers who, you know, in the this particular genre who enjoy talking about this and I can't find a single person who said otherwise. So that's more fuel to the fire. But one thing that's for certain that we should give a little bit of credence to, at least to what you're saying, is that in the comic book industry, we've seen with Warren Ellis and plenty of other things, it's a boys club. And you're either in or you're not. So if Jack Kirby wasn't in, which it sounds like he absolutely wasn't anywhere he went, that it would give a lot of credence, a lot of weight to what you're saying. Well, again, because of the specific history of the Jack Schiff lawsuit, there was bad blood. Kirby was boycotted. That's why. But how ironic that DC's boycotting of Kirby punishing him for suing Jack Schiff, one of their editors. You got to remember, Kirby's the guy that co-created Captain America. He was a big macher, to use a Yiddish word. He Even in 1959, he was still Jack Kirby. He wasn't a schmuck off the street. And yet DC Comics treated him as a schmuck off the street. And then when they were willing to choose, they chose Jack Schiff, a journeyman hack editor, responsible for the worst period of Batman's published history. Nobody gives a flying F about Jack Schiff in comic book history. He's a footnote. And yet DC Comics sided with Schiff over Jack Kirby in 1959. And guess what? Irony is a cruel mistress. Did they not pay the price for that? And then that's why there's credence to my conspiracy theory. Because you don't think they forgot that? They were the guy it's that they always mentor. Mentor back. to student relationship. Listen, I, I know this is a stretch, but you know, the white cop that murdered George Floyd mm. on video. You know they had a history together? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they worked in the nightclub. They were bouncers. Yep. Here's what I think happened. And again, nobody talks about this. Why do you think a white guy like that cop wanted to kill George Floyd? And when he had the chance, he killed him. He didn't even care that he was being shot on video. What do you think happened between the two of them to it make was. so hate Floyd that want to murder them? I bet you something happened at work where George Floyd either took care of a situation that made this white guy embarrassed maybe the white guy was wimpy and and george had to step in whatever happens in the world of bouncers but i bet you this white guy was made to feel shamed in his own mind by floyd and he might have been racist to begin with like a lot of cops are hate to break that news to all of the pro cop people we're from jersey we know thank you uh that's what i think happened and that's what happened with Kirby in D.C. There was bad blood that a corporation 10 years later in the span of a corporation is like a day. I don't think they forgot that the guy that we booted because we chose Jack Schiff has come back to single-handedly beat us. We were D.C. Comics, industry giant. And Jack Kirby, we kicked you out and you came back and beat our asses. Oh, but hey, Jack, come on in and do the fourth world. We'll give you everything you need. Like like uh, Burns on The Simpsons. Like, <laughs> Carmine, did you get Jack Herbie for us? Yes, masters. 
I have Jack Kirby for you. Good job, Carmine. There'll be an extra treat in your paycheck next week. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we're, we're coming full circle. You get my drift. I do. Bill, oh. I we've had a great time. I mean, we've yeah. been talking for two hours. Hour and a half, yeah. Okay. On you the mark, hour 25. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. Uh, but I'll definitely talk to you for a couple minutes after this. But guys, I'm putting all this stuff here. Also, your podcast, you give me that information. I'll make sure I put that along with everything else into a hyperlink to make it that much easier, guys. Hyperlink. This Thursday, right? This Thursday. This was nothing. This was a nugget. This was the slightest preview of what you guys are going to see. If you haven't watched this guy, Arlen, just talk about. Like he said, he listen. It's one thing. Imagine for somebody me to, with pictures. <laughs> Imagine me with pictures. This is just the verbal component. I'm telling you, it's one thing to see the guy talk now and say, "This is what I'm going to do." It's another thing to actually watch him do it. So, by all means, just from memory, if a question is asked, he is on it. There's no need for notes with this guy. Watch knowledgeable, knows what he's doing, interactive. If you can't tell he's speaking with his heart on his sleeve right now, I don't know what TV show you're watching. Permanently on my right? sleeve. Listen, so guys, it's all about love, remember. It's all yeah. about sharing and spreading the love. And love will conquer hate. Love will conquer evil. The Beatles were right. All you need is love. Listen, everything on your back wall, Bill, is about love. Everything on my back wall is about love. And that's really... And even Kirby has a beautiful quote. You ready for this? How about ending on this Kirby quote about love, believe it or not? And I chose to include this in my book, The Silver Age of Comic Art. But tell me this isn't the perfect quote. Okay, Bill? Okay. Kirby said from some previously published interview, I know true love, said Kirby. By the way, it comes from this double page spread about the Silver Surfer that he created. You see that? Which book is that? My Silver Age book. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know true love, said Kirby. And knowing true love, I think, is one of the greatest feelings in the world. You can't have a wonderful life without love. I love my children. I love my, re my relatives. I love my audience. And these are my true feelings. I'll never deny them. I suppose I love everybody. To Guys. Quote, to quote it, who, who no. shall not be named. Enough said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go on. Okay, Bill. Okay. This so this... This coming Thursday, the 29th, guys, if you buy a ticket to it and you for some reason can't watch it live, you can still get the webinar afterwards. The links will be below. It's going right. to be available for an entire week afterwards. So you can watch it live. You still got it for another week. You miss it. You still got it for the week. I'm exactly. saying. And then Wednesday night, I'll give you the information. The night before, I'm doing my blogtalkradio.com nightlight show interviewing Mark Evanier, who was Kirby's assistant during the fourth world years. So we're going to get a lot of great information uh, in my two hours there. So I'll send uh, Bill the links when we get off the air here and he'll be able to post those as well. So, and For then them, they're already there. No, after my Kirby thing, I'm doing a webinar on Bruce Springsteen, one on the twilight zone. And then my last one for the year so far will be on the 50th anniversary of Neil Adams' Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. Nice. Which was equally groundbreaking. Also prematurely decapitated, just like Kirby's Fourth World in 1970. Interesting that they both ran at the same time. And those will be my last two comic book history webinars for the year. And then I have to kind of sit down with New York Adventure Club and figure out that crushes me. What to do for the coming year. So that's a, a slate of my activities, Bill. And thank you for having me on. Thanks for being here. Guys, we'll talk to you later. On behalf of Arlen, Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed. <laughs>